Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today we're going to look at SOLIDWORKS simulation and trebuchets. My name is Robert Warren. I'm a CAE specialist with 3D Vision Technologies. And today we're going to talk a little bit about trebuchet history, you know, where they came from, how they work, trebuchet design, and a little bit of simulation. So where this project kind of came into play was my friend uh, called me. His son is in the Cub Scouts. And they wanted to introduce some engineering and science and technology uh, to them. And the scout leader had an idea to build a trebuchet. But they needed somebody with some engineering design experience to help them out with that. So I quickly signed up. And this presentation that I'm showing you is very similar to the one that I showed the Cub Scouts uh, in, in the process of presenting them with the trebuchet kit. Um, that they later built and then, then utilized. So let's talk a little bit about trebuchet history. So trebuchets kind of came on the scene around 12th century um, medieval times. And they were really used as a siege engine. So they were used to knock down castle walls, things like that. And originally, they were powered by soldiers. So just a, a series of pulleys and ropes. And you know, as, a, as the soldiers pulled on the ropes, it, it moved this big lever arm in, uh, through the projectile. Uh, you know, at, at the enemies. It later evolved into a counterpoise or a gravity-driven um, system with a counterweight, which is what you see over to the right. And that's the type of trebuchet that we designed uh, then. So some common ammo, because these siege engines were actually built outside of the castle, um, giving the enemies plenty of time to know uh, that they were coming, the ammunition was really what was laying around in the field. So big tree stumps, rocks, uh, and even you know things like cows. So Monty Python made fun of this, um, but you know that that was something that uh, was a possibly thrown. So what we threw uh, or were going to throw with the Cubs house were pumpkins, soccer balls. We actually ended up using a medicine ball, a uh, six pound medicine ball, a eight pound medicine ball, and a ten pound medicine ball, just to kind of show the difference uh, between those and how it affected the trajectory and distance of flight. So how they work, uh, the trebuchet is really devised of a main frame. It has a throwing arm, which is really just a big lever. Uh, it has a pivot point that's attached to the frame, and then a counterweight. And there's several designs out there for how the counter counterweight interacts. So some have a fixed counterweight. For ours, we chose a swinging counterweight. And what that does is it kind of keeps the direction of the weight more in line with gravity. And then there's other ones that have a, a system where it actually follows a track. So the sling, uh, then, is actually one of the most crucial points uh, of the design. And it's actually one that we waited until last to do. But essentially, the sling is over some uh, pin at the end of the arm. And it's attached on one end, and the other end is able to uh, slide off, allowing it to uh, let the projectile uh, go. So a trebuchet works because you're building into the system potential energy. So by raising that counterweight, up to a certain height. And, and our throwing arm, just for reference, is actually eight feet. So that was an eight foot four by four that we utilized. So we're putting this, this uh, potential energy into the system with a bunch of weight in that basket. And you have this big lever arm that's pivoting. And when you let go, when you pull that firing pin, it allows that weight to drop, develops, uh, goes from potential energy to kinetic energy, and starts bringing that sling out and eventually, at the point where your pin, your firing pin, or your uh, sling pin at the end, and the sling kind of open up all those angles and stuff, it gets a little bit complicated. But you can tune that in to have a very nice 45 degree trajectory, or be a little bit more flat or a little bit higher, um, based on the weight, the size of the ball, and so forth. But at the essentially at the apex of the arc, maybe a little bit before, that sling actually opens up and releases the projectile out uh, towards towards the target. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, trebuchet design. So inside of SOLIDWORKS, I actually utilize weldments um, to generate the frame. And there were a couple main points with this and reasons that I wanted to do that. One was it made changes very easy. And what you see on the left there is my original design. I didn't allow for enough clearance for the counterweight. So when the arm was in a vertical position, I only had about a half an inch clearance. And if that weight were to shift, which it would in real life as it was swinging through there, it was going to intersect with the bottom of the frame 
that would have caused all kinds of problems. Well, I quickly understood that with the assembly and was able to redesign it just by changing the, the sketch, the underlying sketch of the weldment and generating that. The other nice thing was the weldment generated a cut list. So I knew the exact length of all these 4x4s, the 2x4s that we used to design this. I was able to pass it off to my friend. He was able to pass it off to the Cub Scout leader. And then they were able to shop and gather all the materials that we needed to build this without you know, doing a lot of math and calculating and, and guessing. Uh, from there, I put everything into an assembly. And they utilized smart fasteners. And again, those smart fasteners gave me a list of fasteners that we needed for the design. So it was a really nice um, way of doing it. And it, it actually was able to illustrate and show the, the kids you know, how this is really in 3D. And then they were able to build it. In, in real life. So here's a trebuchet model. So this is the full assembly. Uh, let me open up the frame here. And with this frame, this was designed as a weldment. So what you see over here on the left-hand side is we have some underlying sketches. So for example, we have this one here. So this was just laying out the base of the frame. So I used the full 8 feet in length by 48 wide to kind of deride the, the uh, base for this. And if we look, uh, and I edit the feature of the weldment, all that I did was I was able to specify a custom 4x4 wood um, profile, which, by the way, is 3.5 by 3.5, so the lumber yard is lying to you. Um, most of us know this. So I, I didn't do any corner treatment on it. Generally, with weldments, the uh, software will trim these accordingly, like an overlap, and underlap, or a miter. For this, though, we wanted to design this so that the kids could easily put this together. So I actually just ended up doing some manual cuts for some overlap uh, joints. And then for like this one here, um, if, if uh, we look at this, I actually have a cutout on both beams so that they just notch together. So one of the important things that I wanted was to provide them with essentially a kit that they could build uh, and have it working right away. We didn't want them to use any saws or, or uh, dado blades or anything like that, but basically just wrenches, um, maybe, maybe some drills for the older ones uh, to screw in the leg, the leg screws and bolt this together. So my friend and I actually notched all these together, uh, cut everything to length according to the cut list and according to SOLIDWORKS. I actually didn't even use a 2D drawing, and I really could have gone the route of using MBD, which is putting all the information in the model uh, and then publish, publishing out like a 3D PDF. But in reality, what I did, I just brought my laptop to uh, his house. We started measuring right away. So I was able to go in here and say, OK, we need one of these that's 62 inches long. We cut it. We drill the holes in appropriate places once we started assembling this together. And then once we had the frame, we actually disassembled it. And this is where they were able to put it together very easily. I actually had a template for the holes here. So each corner was the same. So no matter where they kind of aligned it, they were able to put it together. And what I did was I actually hid all of these bodies uh, as you go through the cut list items. I hid the ones that were appropriate. So stage by stage, I had a projector up. And we were building this, um, or I showed them how to build it before they actually went out and did it. And then obviously, the adults uh, supervised that. But the underlying sketches made it really easy and nice to, to switch uh, from one one kind of layout to another. And like I said, I was able to see where that uh, counterweight was was potentially going to hit. The other thing that this allowed me to do then was put in all of my smart fasteners. I actually only used two different types of lag screws. So once the holes were all put in through utilizing the hole wizard, it auto-populated all the lag screws appropriately. I knew how many of the shorter uh, two and a half inch length so for example, right here where we have this cross brace uh, onto the A-frame, or the longer ones where these were 5 inch, uh, because we needed to make sure that they penetrated into both uh, boards. Actually, these are 2 and a half inch. Sorry, this one here that cuts in at an angle, that one was a 5 inch. So we appropriately knew what we had to do. Now with regards to the counterweight, uh, my friend and I actually made this all together, because we um, screwed this using deck screws together. Uh, we didn't want them to have to try to construct this, but we did have them put it up and, and kind of build it on the on the throwing arm. So that's that's really the design. I utilized SolidWorks to kind of come up with the the frame and everything. Um, and then the next step really was to go in and look at this.
from a simulation standpoint. So one of the things that I was really concerned with was safety. Uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of small kids. We wanted to make sure that they were safe uh, while, while operating and utilizing this. So that's where solar simulation came into play. Now, I did use a static linear analysis for this. What is orthotropic? I actually allowed it to be isotropic. Uh, it was just an assumption that I made with it. But I did create a custom pine material with an appropriate yield strength. The tube was Schedule 40, uh, two-inch pipe. And then I used an appropriate steel material for that. And what you see on the screen here is the layout. So I fixed the end of the arm. I figure worst case is going to be where this arm is horizontal. So we've got the full action of the, the force acting, uh, the full moment to the pivot. And what I did was I just push down, I apply gravity for the self weight of the structure, and I push down on the inside of the counterweight with originally we were going to go with 600 pounds and we were going to make this cement. And what ended up happening was I got a phone call and they said that they needed to use this also in a parade. And what ended up happening was we switched from cement to sand, which actually lowered my total weight to 450 pounds of, of counterweight. So when I tested this in inside a simulation, what we ended up doing, uh, let me switch my configuration here that I have for FEA. I'm going to turn on my simulation add-in. Uh, when we tested this, I actually tested it for 800 pounds. And what I found was about a 12,000 psi uh, stress on, on the main axle is, is where we actually saw that. And in reality, that had a uh, strength of 32,000 uh, psi. So we were more than good. And I felt pretty confident uh, in this, especially since we were only utilizing a counterweight of 450 pounds. And if I switch to that configuration, where all I did was I went in and I modified the uh, force that was put on that basket, what you're going to see here is when I show this, we're right around 8,000 pounds, 7,500, uh, 8,000 pounds, which is well under. So my factor of safety for this, uh, if we go in and we look at this, is well over two, which is usually a, a good design point uh, in, with respect to this one, we're at a factor of safety of four for the uh, amount of counterweight that we have on this. And if you look at the 800 pounds, we're still right around a factor of safety of 2.75. And if you want to kind of take into account dynamic loading and things like that, um, you know, it, it, the shock load, things like that, the 800 pounds really kind of put us there. And at a factor of safety of 2.5, it really gave us a, a good warm fuzzy that we were more than, more than okay. Uh, with the design. So the next step then was actually to look at this from a motion standpoint, from a kinematic standpoint. And because SOLIDWORKS Motion is a rigid body dynamics um, package, one of the things that I had to do was kind of add this fake um, spoon on the end of my arm with the projectile. So motion is fully um, derived from the mates in the assembly. So those really tell the software how this is going to behave. So when I have things unmated, this is able to swing and move appropriately. And that's how we really needed it to, to work. Then I also utilized friction uh, in between the arm and the um, pin or, or, or the um, axle. And that allowed it to rotate and have kind of a dampening uh, effect on that. So let me actually turn off my uh, simulation add-in. I'm going to switch to a configuration that was I used for motion, which actually adds that, that kind of scoop and arm. And because that sling is flexible and it opens up kind of at the top of the, of, of the trajectory, I actually used a four-foot sling. So it was actually eight feet in total length, four feet to the center of it. So that's what this is, is mimicking. Let me go ahead and turn on motion, and we'll take a look at some of the results that I was able to get from that. And interestingly enough, with 450 pounds, um, the results matched very well with this with this setup. Later, um, I, I had left at that point. My friend and, and all the Cub Scouts and stuff said, well, how can we kind of get more weight into this? And ingeniously enough, because it was dry sand, they just started making it wet sand. So they put a bunch of water in it. Now, we don't know an exact uh, weight of the of the counterweight, but they did some sling adjustments. Uh, we made it so that that could be uh, adjusted. And what they were able to do is actually throw it uh, quite a bit further, another 20 or so yards uh, beyond what we were able to do with the 450 pounds.
But what you see here is we see motion analysis. And what this does is it just divides up your screen and gives you kind of this keyframe uh, analysis type. And we can control mates. We can turn on and off mates uh, with this. And what I ended up doing was as because I had to have the ball hold in the scoop, I turned the mate off right at the point where the, the sling really would have opened up. And if we watch this here, and it's kind of small on the screen, um, and it would help if my mates were turned on. Give me one second here. I apologize. So let's actually recalculate this. And what we should see here is the counterweight starting to drop. The arm is, is moving. Uh, it's holding that ball. And as it starts to get towards the, the appropriate uh, apex where we, where we kind of decided that the real one was, it releases um, that projectile and actually throws that quite, quite a ways. Um, from that, what we were able to extrapolate was if I go down here to my results, is I can look at all these different uh, plots. So this is my angular velocity at the tip of the arm. Now, not at the sling, but at the tip of the arm uh, in degrees per second. And I can also look at the linear acceleration of the arm uh, as well. You can take this uh, data from, from the maximum and kind of get put this into your projectile motion um, calculations by hand. I've got angular acceleration. One of the ones that I, I did do was a uh, linear displacement. Now this is in inches, and this is actually throwing at about 30 uh, or so yards, which was very close to what we were able to do with the 450 pounds. Now they were able to add another 27, 28 yards to that just by increasing the counterweight and then adjusting the sling for an optimal uh, throwing angle. But if we play this again, you know what we're able to see is it it does release that that uh, projectile. The arm actually swings very realistically and kind of damps down. And what you're seeing there is I actually stopped it so that it was uh, at the ground plane. So you know how did that really compare to real life? Well, this is a video of of the trebuchet. Now this is with the 450 pounds. This is before the uh, the weight, uh, the additional weight was added to it. But what you see here is we we've got a a, a child that's going to pull the pin. And it's going to release this this uh, eight pound. This was actually an eight pound uh, medicine ball. It gave a good uh, you know a good distance to that. Let me actually just play it again so you can see that. Notice we kept all the kids as far back as possible. So we had a very long talk about the amount of energy in the system and how uh, potentially dangerous that is. But the kids all had a really uh, fun time kind of putting that together and you know, um, learning about it. And from what I heard, uh, next year they want to go bigger. So that's going to be the next design. So uh, ultimately we want to start actually throwing some pumpkins and knocking down uh, fake walls and things like that. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar. We kind of talked about a history, how trebuchets work, a little bit of the design inside of SolidWorks, the simulation behind it. And that was really just a a feel good uh, at this point to make sure that you know everything was safe. It was it was definitely an over designed uh, frame, but we certainly could take that take that and um, move forward with it. So thank you very much uh, for attending. And uh, if we have any questions, go ahead and type those into the uh, question portion of the um, of the of the GoToMeeting interface, and uh, we can go from there. So it looks like we do have one question. And the question is, uh, wouldn't if the frame was designed as a weldment, wouldn't that automatically transfer into beams inside a simulation? And you're exactly right. Uh, you have the ability to right click on any one of those beams and tell the, tell the software to treat it as a solid. I was more concerned with the von Mises stress. I knew the frame was over designed being four by fours. So I wasn't too worried about uh, buckling or you know bending moment or axial uh, stress on those beams. I was more worried about the main uh, pivot arm and then or main pivot uh, pipe and then the arm itself. And I wanted to see the von Mises stress uh, on that. So that that was a great question. So thank you very much for attending and have a uh, great day.